This program is made possible in part by the Maryland Arts Council through the State of Maryland and the National Endowment for the Arts and the Howard County Arts Council through a grant from Howard County Government. Hello and welcome to The Writing Life. My name is Terence Winch and it's my pleasure today to introduce you to Frank McCourt. Frank McCourt made literary history in 1996 with the publication of Angela's Ashes, the first of uh, three memoirs that he's published since that time. Angela's Ashes was a, uh, is a story of misery and poverty starting in Brooklyn and uh, moving quickly to, uh, to Limerick in Ireland. Uh, where Frank spent his, his youth. But the story itself was, uh, was made into something uh, transcendent through Frank's uh, amazing sense of humor and wit. He brought to this material a, uh, a, an attitude and perspective that, that people just hadn't seen before and hadn't read before. The book went on to be an incredible success, as have the second two books, uh, Tiz and Teacher Man, um, Angela's Ashes became a major uh, Hollywood movie in 1999 and uh, has sold well over six million copies, has been translated in, into many languages, spent 117 weeks on the bestseller list. All in all, an incredible fantasy, Frank, that, uh, that you know, many people have had but you've actually experienced. And I wonder how that, that alchemy of turning poverty and misery into a fame and, and yeah. wealth, how that feels inside you. Well, it wasn't something I expected. <clears throat> I, I, I never wanted to write about growing up poor in Ireland. I wanted to write a witty, sophisticated novel like Evelyn Waugh or David Lodge or Graham Greene, one of those smart-ass uh, Aldous Huxley witty uh, conversation novels. But, I, and, and, but when I was teaching in New York, the more I talked, and the kids would try to get me off the subject of grammar, say, and they'd ask me about my life, and I would tell them. And then, uh, then when I retired from teaching, I started writing Angel's Ashes, and I didn't expect the success. I, had, I, I didn't even have a publisher. I didn't have an agent. I thought a former student of mine worked, worked for Oxford Press, mm -hmm. and I called him, and uh, I sent him a, sh a few pages, and he said he was sorry. It, as your publisher, publishers always say, it, this is not for us. Really? This right. not, he said, he said uh, with all due respect, Mr. McCourt, I think this will appeal to middle-aged, middle-class Irish widows. Really? <laughs> and, right. and good luck, he said. So I, what a bad uh, call. It, well, yeah, but yeah. It, it, I, I, I moved on. And then uh, when, the, when the book was published, I didn't expect to be on the bestseller list. It started in the New York Times. It had 15 books. It started with 15 and began to move up. And the next thing, Hollywood calls. And next thing, it's a movie, which didn't really make any money. It was a bit too, it was a bit too bleak. But all of this happened to me. And when many things happen to you, uh, you're in a state of shock. How do you deal with it? Yeah. You're, 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 you're 66 years of age. Most of your life is behind you, I suppose. You've done your 30 years of teaching and so on and you've knocked around a lot, and this happens to you. And the next thing, um, the book goes on the bestseller list. Then you, you go to a bookstore in New York, and you, you talk to a large crowd. You wonder, what the hell are they doing here? This is a book about misery. And then I'm up in Boston at the public library, huge auditorium, and uh, it was so crowded, it spilled into other rooms where they put TV monitors. And then you don't have time to think about it, to reflect on it, because then, then they, they put you on the road and mm -hmm. on, on, on the book tour. So all of this has happened to me in the next two books, the, the movie. So all in my case, at my age, all you think about is the next book. Thanks for all the, the, the money that came in with Angela's Ashes, and it freed me. I don't have to count pennies anymore sure. the way I yeah. did when I was a teacher, yeah. you know, the princely teacher's salary. 
And actually, there might have been a great advantage to uh, achieving that level of success late in life because, right. oh. you know, who you are is such yeah. a settled issue by then. Terry, if I had achieved any success in, in, in my 20s or 30s, I'd be dead now of yeah. women and whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have been able to handle it. Because I was, I was very friendly with the Clancy brothers at New York. I and they, know, were, yeah. they were big drinkers and out all night. And I was a teacher. And I think uh, I used to see some of them, not just the Clancy's, but other people going a bit wild. And a lot, a lot of them fell by the wayside. And of course, your brother Malachi had yeah. a very famous uh, pub. Uh, in yeah, there. he did. He had a, he, but he was way up town, and I hung out mostly in the village. But I wouldn't have been able to handle it. So whatever, whatever success I have came to me in my sixties mm. and, and, and beyond. So I'm, I'm lucky yeah. that I can't stay out all night like a wild <laughs> man. <laughs> um, I know that. Uh, um, you've cited uh, Gore Vidal's comment about memoirs being an impression mm. of a life yeah. and obviously not, uh, not um, uh, like an autobiography yeah. where you're, you're sticking to the, the sort of public yeah. record. And Angela's Ashes is kind of known uh, among its fans and readers for the, the incredible level of detail mm. and memory that seems to have come into play in your recreating yeah. your impression of your you know, childhood. Yeah. And yeah. Um, uh, obviously, with Tiz and with Teacher Man, th those are recounting experiences that ha happen later in life. But I wonder if you could um, walk us through that process a little bit of how Angela's Ashes. What was what was really the sort of genesis of it? I, you know, there was the the teaching experience and and all of that. But had you been writing? Uh, had you been keeping like a journal or a diary or keeping notes or how were you getting at those? Those well, seminal memories. My my way of, of of recollecting all of this was as a teacher in, in New York City High School. I started off one of the, one of the roughest high schools in New York called McKee Vocational. And in those days, people say, well, if you if you're going to be a teacher, you stay away from vocational <laughs> high school. This was West Side Story, you know, intensified yes. because of the gang war. There were a lot of gang wars going on. There. But that's the only job I could get because when I went around to schools. And I would meet the heads of English departments, and they'd say, "Well, you know, you seem to be very bright and all that, but we have this problem problem with the brogue, mm. the brogue. Uh, you know, we don't want our kids to go home sounding like Barry Fitzgerald." And <laughs> so I, I, it was hard for me to get a job, and I got a job only because nobody else would take a job in the school. It was very hard, but um, they were. It was the, it, it, ironically enough, it, it is my accent that, that enabled me to survive in McKee vocation. And, and one of the kids said, yo, you Scotch or something? Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, I'm, no, I'm Irish. And what's Irish? And I had to mm -hmm. explain. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, then they'd want to know. Then they used this. They were very clever. Kids do this in every school. All of you have done it. Uh, uh, to keep the, t if in case I might have written on the board something more grammar, sure. parts of it. Yeah. Oh, so so like Mr. McCourt, you know, uh, what kind of food did you eat in Ireland, Mr. McCourt? Did you, uh, Mr. McCourt, what kind of music did you like in Ireland? Keep, just keep your work. So yo, Mr. McCourt, uh, in Ireland, did you go out with girls? No, sheep. We went out with sheep because I got so frustrated. Yeah. They're trying to get back. So um, all of this was going on, and they. Although I knew this, they were trying to keep me away from so-called grammar. At the at the same time, fifty percent of it was was drawing me out, and fifty percent of it was reminiscing about growing up in Ireland. And I, I would think to myself, I'm looking at them; they're sixteen and seventeen. Mm -hmm. At that age in Ireland, I didn't know anything, right. because they were very easy with girls. Like, there was a nice attitude, easy. Uh, relationship between the boys and girls. And we were all uptight in Ireland because everything there was a sin. Right. So all of this was happening. And I wasn't keeping a journal or anything like that, but it, it was beginning to grow in my head, cumulatively. Would it effect. start happening to you as you were telling a story yeah. to the class? Would you start remembering other oh, yeah. levels? Of yeah. So, and this is uh, that I began to realize, realize that that kind of past never leaves you. You, you, you. you practically need to go into therapy seven days a week. Sure. Because it, w it was very dramatic and traumatic growing up in Ireland like that, and the same thing applies to any 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 kid who grows up in 
you know, what would you call poor circumstances. So yeah. it was always with me. And, and then the tremendous power of the church. They had us and they had it completely under their power. Right. So that we, everything was a sin, especially if it had to do with the flesh. That's no longer true? Oh, they don't give a damn. <laughs> but for me, you mean? <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I have a strong sense of sin, all right, but it doesn't afflict me the yeah, way it used to. No, we were tormented when we were kids. You know, if you're a teenage boy, you might engage in what they call the sin of self-abuse. Mm. I never felt abused, but there you are. Yeah. But you had to, uh, you had to confess it anyway. Any, they, they, any, something called bad thoughts, bad words, bad deeds, and then oh, impure God, thoughts. Yeah. You had to go. You had to go yeah. c confess. Yeah. Um, you and and Malachi put together a a, a show based mm. on your upbringing yeah. in Ireland. Yeah. Uh, a couple of blackguards. Right. Um, can you give us a little sense of the, the history of that? And did that come into play with the with writing Angela's Ashes? Oh no, no. no? Uh, that that was before Angela's Ashes. And oh, yeah, and, yeah. because I was always I was always noodling around with the with the with this this material from yeah. Ireland. Yeah. And then coming over. This this the big exper the transatlantic experience. So uh, I I thought one time since I was always telling stories in the classroom and Maliki as a bartender was all always going on behind the bar. So I I suggested we, we get together and, and do something. And I can tell you in the beginning, it was very raw, practically unscripted. We get up on the stage and yak, yak, yak. Oh, really? And ev ev eventually yeah. it had to be put together into a script. And that we did that here and there around New York and Chicago. I was just wondering whether that was a, a, a source of remembering more. Uh, no, no, because no. When, when I wrote Angel's Ashes, I didn't want to use anything from a couple of black. Oh, I only okay. used one thing, a communion scene. Okay. That was all. I wanted. I wanted to be fresh. So, so when when Angela's when when you started writing Angela's Ashes, can you can you bring us back to how that happened? I mean, you're retired yeah. from teaching. Yeah. You're in your sixties. You're hanging out in your your apartment in New York, and you decide, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna really get serious about this. Yeah. And sit down. Well, and write what happened book. was I I got married uh -huh. for the third time. Uh huh. And. Uh, I'm a slow learner. So uh, <laughs> that was in August of 1994. And a few weeks after that, I, I, we had the, rented this little house in, on the Delaware River in Pennsylvania. And a few weeks after that, I, I had the notebook in my lap. And, I, and this sounds ridiculous or miraculous or something. I started writing the, uh, the first couple of pages mm -hmm. of Angel's Ashes as if, the fl as if it flowed out of my pen. And I remember those pages that I wrote were never altered. Whatever really? came out that day, were, the words were never altered. Uh, it begins with my, my mother and father should have stayed in New York where they met and where, I, where they met and married and where I was born. And that was the beginning of it. And then uh, it continued to flow. And I, be, it, there was something about my life then where I'm married now for the third time and this is a good marriage and I, f and I'm, I have the time, I'm retired from teaching. I did part-time teaching in a community college. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I kept working at this book, and I didn't know what I was going to do with it because you know, I, I had no publisher, I had no agent. Did you uh, write the whole thing in longhand? Yeah, I, I wrote in a composition book, a oh. series of compositions. How long did it take you? Uh, Thirteen months. Hmm. I did, but then I would put it onto the computer later on because I don't like writing on the computer. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I had a method for anybody interested might 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 like this method, which I found very helpful. You have a notebook. And I write, write today's narrative on the right page. And on the left page, if I had an idea about anything, I'd put it on the left page. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's what happened with Angel's Ashes. I was, the first 19 pages have to do with my mother and father meeting in New York and how I was born and so on. And then one day I, wrote, I said, I, tomorrow I'm going to write, start writing about my first memory. And I wrote down, I'm in a playground in Brooklyn with my brother Malachi. We're on the seesaw. He goes up, I go down. He goes up, I go down. I get off. He got off and he, he hit the ground yeah. and he bit his tongue. So that's, that was my first memory. And that method of writing on the right and making notes on the left carried me through the whole book. Did you write every day during that Yeah, period? I did. I did because yeah. it was, as, 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 as Hemingway would have said, it was coming yeah. and it was good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, thought, I thought it was good. I was, I, all, the other thing about it, that when I wrote that, 
uh, I'm in the playground in Brooklyn. That's through the perspective of a three and a half year old. Right. And I kept it simple. People said to me, well, why don't you use quotation marks? I, I don't need, children don't use quotation marks. Right. So I, there's a minimum of punctuation just as a child. So I start with three, four, five, up to 19. And I suppose the language progress. I realized later on, this is what, exactly what James Joyce did yeah. in A Portrait of the Artist. That's right, yeah. So that, 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 that was almost. You knew you were onto something. I knew, it, and it was so enjoyable yeah. to sit with, the, with this. Uh, sometimes I use a little uh, lap desk, and I'd write on that. And uh, then in the afternoon, I'd, uh, I'd have lunch, and, and my wife, and then I'd go, I'd go back and do it. And at the end of the day, then, I'd read her what I'd written. She always said it was good. And of course, she would. She's a new wife. So yeah. she thought I was. Well, you said now that one of your former students turned it down. Who yeah. first opened the door to it? What happened was I had the, I had, had a, about half a book written, and a friend of mine, Mary Breston Smith, who was um, a novelist herself and a, for, a reporter for the New York Times, she asked me what I was writing. And I said, well, I'm writing this memoir. And she said she'd like to see it. I said, no, you wouldn't. It's all about misery <laughs> and Catholicism and sordidness. No, no, she said, I'd like to see it. And she, she took, I sent it to her, and she read it in one sitting. I had about 180 pages. And uh, then she said she was going to show it to her agent, who told her, no, nah, the Irish thing is over. Really? People are not interested. So then she, another woman who was her neighbor up in Bedford Hills in New York, Molly Friedrich, Molly said, well, what is it about? Ireland, you know, growing up in oh, no, no, Molly said, no. <laughs> Uh, that Mr. James Joyce has taken care of that. Yeah. So Mary insisted, Molly read it and liked it, and then she took it to Scribner, and they bought it. They gave me the, the advance, and uh, that was in um, June of, of uh, 95, mm -hmm. and I had a meeting with the editor at Scribner. I said, when will you finish it? And I said, November. November? You finish half a book in November? By no I said, yeah, five months. Oh, I, and I said, I'll bring it in November 30th. <laughs> November, why? I said, that's the birthday of my favorite writer, Jonathan Swift. Oh, and I showed up uh, with the finished book on November 30th, and they said, you're setting a bad precedent. <laughs> Writers never finish things on time. So that was, that and, was the and beginning. And you said they printed, what, like? 27,000. 27,000 yeah. copies. And then it went up to millions. Well, even that for a first book was probably a fairly healthy print. It was, I mean, yeah, So they must have had some faith well, in it. Well, they, the, they had that section of it in the New Yorker in yeah. June 1995. Which I remember very I, well. I learned yeah. about the buzz in the publishing industry. There was yeah. buzz. And then, of course, the book is published, and then there's the movie. And, and then there's me meeting this one, being sent all over the country. They're sending a private plane for me. Paramount sends a private plane for me. To 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 uh, 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 that airport in New Jersey. Only me on this plane and two pilots really? and all this booze and sandwiches and all that. And I said, Jesus. This was in You're, connection with the film. Yeah. yeah. And you said, I wrote a book about absolute poverty and misery. And look at me. Alan Parker made a, a, an actually beautiful movie of Angela's Ashes with Robert Carlyle and uh, Emily Watson. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was uh, uh, really sort of captured the spirit of the book very successfully, and I wondered whether you had much involvement with the uh, with the film. No, they they bought it, and then they 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 would um, let me know what was going on. They, 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 they first, for instance, they wanted to choose uh, Liam Neeson. He was all set to do oh, it okay. as my father, but I think there was a problem with money, so they got Robert Carlyle, who, who who's Scottish. And then um, I, I was sorry in a way that Liam Neeson didn't do it because his mother lived next door to my aunt up really? in the north of Ireland wow. uh, in a town called Ballymena. That would, that would have been very interesting because he's, he knows the area. He knew the area. He had the right accent and everything. But that didn't happen. The movie came out then. It got mixed reviews and disappeared. But everybody says it's beautifully photographed and so on. But it there's something. Gorgeous. It was a very, too sad, maybe. I don't know. You know, I, I, watching it again, I thought it really uh, worked very, very yeah. well. I mean, there's just I mean, such great material there. The, the, uh, the kids who, the, there were three young actors who yeah. played you in, in your youth, and I wonder 
um, uh, how how much you identified with them when you saw them on screen? Well, you know, I, I at that I was trying to adjust to everything. I was trying to adjust to the sense to the success of the book. I was trying to write the second book, Tears, and then I was I was trying to deal with the fact that they'd made a movie of my life. Jesus, <laughs> it's extraordinary. Yeah. And when they when they invite us up to the screening room in New York, myself and my wife, and uh, David Brown, the producer, and then another assistant director. Uh, I'm sitting there looking at this movie. It's about me. And my wife is sucking up the Kleenex, and weeping all over the place. And I said, for the first time in my life, when we came out of the movie, I said, I need a drink. <laughs> and they bought, me, they bought me an Irish whiskey. But it's very hard to get to, to accustom yourself to this kind of attention, yeah. especially when you've been a, a, an obscure teacher for 30 years. Sure. Nobody gives a damn about teachers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Nobody paid me a scrap of attention. Right. Then yeah. you make, then you write a book, and oh, yeah. oh yeah. yeah, you see these characters in the streets of New York. You're the guy that wrote that book <laughs> right. because I've seen you on television. Yeah. yeah, my mother likes that book. Right. I said, what about you? Well, you know, I don't have time. Yeah. <laughs> so it, a lot of it had to do with women. You know, I wanted to ask you. We're we're, we're starting to run out of time. I want to ask you to read something uh, in a minute. But I was also personally delighted to see in Tiz, uh, several references to the great Mickey Carton and Ruthie Morrissey. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I actually played in Mickey Carton's band no, when I was 16, really? yeah, back in the early 60s. And I, I would love to see, I'm just putting in my own pitch here, I would love to see you do a book that really focuses on what it was like being in that, oh, that Irish immigrant world yeah. in the 50s. The dance sure halls. Yeah, the dance halls, yeah. the Jager House, and oh, yeah, the, all yeah, of those places, yeah. you know. Um, that's but a, that be okay. for another interview. Meanwhile, um, we okay. talked about your reading a, a passage from Angela's Ashes to uh, close out our, our talk here today. Uh, this has to do with preparing for First Communion. The priests will come soon to examine us in the catechism and everything else. The schoolmaster himself has to show us how to receive Holy Communion. He tells us gather round him. He fills his hat with the newspaper, the Limerick leader, torn into little bits. He gives Paddy Clossy the hat, kneels on the floor, tells Paddy to take one bit of paper and place it on his tongue, the master's tongue. He shows us how to stick out the tongue, receive the bit of paper, hold it a moment, draw in the tongue, fold your hands in prayer, look toward heaven, close your eyes in adoration, wait for the paper to melt in your mouth, swallow it, thank God for the gift, the sanctifying grace. When he sticks out his tongue, we have to hold in the laugh because we never saw a big purple tongue before. He opens his eyes to catch the boys who are giggling, but he can't see anything because he still has God in his tongue, and it's a holy moment. He gets off his knees and put, tells us kneel around the classroom for the holy communion practice. He goes around the room, placing bits of paper on our tongues and mumbling in Latin. Some boys giggle, and he roars at them that if the giggling doesn't stop, it's not holy communion they'll be getting but the last rite. So what is that sacrament called, McCourt? Extreme unction, sir. That's right, McCourt. Not bad for a yank from the sinful shores of America. He tells us we have to be careful to stick out our tongues far enough so the communion wafer won't fall to the floor. He says, that's the worst thing that can happen to a priest. If that wafer slides off your tongue, the poor priest has to get down on his two knees, pick it up with his own tongue, and lick the floor around it in case it bounced from one spot to another. That priest could get a splinter that would make his tongue swell to the size of a turnip, and that's enough to choke you and kill you entirely. He tells us that next to a relic of the true cross, the communion wafer is the holiest thing in the world, and our first communion is the holiest moment in our lives. Talking about first communion makes him all excited. He paces back and forth, waves his stick, tells us, we must never forget that the moment the Holy Communion is placed on our tongues, we, be, we become members of that most glorious congregation, the one Holy Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church, that for 2,000 years men, women, and children have died for the faith, that the Irish have nothing to be ashamed of in the martyr department. Haven't we provided martyrs galore? Haven't we bared our necks to the Protestant acts? Haven't we mounted the scaffold singing as if embarking on a picnic? Haven't we, boys? We have, sir. What have we done, boys? 
Bared our necks to the Protestant act, sir, and mounted the scaffold singing, sir, as if embarking on a picnic, sir. He says that perhaps in this class there's a future priest or a martyr for the faith, though he doubts it very much, for we are the laziest gang of ignoramuses it has ever been his misfortune to teach. <laughs> thank you very much, Frank McCourt, and thank you for watching The Writing Life.